Uh, presenter will be Associate Professor Dr. Farizal uh, Faz Fazil. Yeah? Uh, 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 Prof. Farizal is from the Neurosurgery Department. He is a consultant neurosurgeon mm, and a lecturer. Yeah? Uh, so, they'll be talking on a topic uh, entitled Finding the Key uh, to Unlock a Gem Door. Yeah? Uh, okay, so without further ado, I would like to uh, call upon our presenters, starting from Dr. Shireen. Uh, just a gentle reminder for you all to keep uh, the time yeah, so that we can finish by 9. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Shireen. All right, good morning. Thank you, Madam Chairperson, Prof. Mahani from the Psychiatry Department. Uh, very good morning to my fellow speakers, uh, Prof. Farizal from the Neurosurgery Department and Dr. Jane from our Psychiatry Department, consultants, specialists, colleagues, and students here today. My name is Dr. Shirin, and today I'll be presenting uh, a case. And it is called Finding the Key to Unlock a Jammed Door. So, as I present the case, you will probably understand why the presentation has been titled so. Okay, so I'll be speaking about my patient, Mr. W, or WLW. He's a 29-year-old Chinese gentleman, single, lives with his parents. So, essentially, his cause of illness started at 19 years of age, which means he's actually been unwell for the past 10 years, a whole decade. So it actually started after a breakup, which he had um, at the time when he was in college. And after the breakup uh, with his girlfriend, he had a prominent repetitive behavior uh, noticed by, of course, himself and people around him. He would need to wear his clothes, take them off about 16 times when he's getting dressed. He would need to take a bath about 16 times, which of course um, would cause him to take two to three hours to actually get ready and actually leave the house. Uh, so it's no surprise that would kind of uh, affect his um, activities of daily life and actually doing his studies, going out for functions and all such things. So he, sometimes he would be turning his head several times to look at the clock just to check if that is the correct time. Um, it would be about four to six times, and he needs to count while he eats. So he would take about four to five hours to eat. So when I mean he counts while he eats, is that when there's a few dishes in front of his um, on the table, and he needs to put it on his plate, he needs to count the exact amount of sauce that needs to go on the plate. So six spoons of sauce, maybe about six spoons of veggies, six spoons of rice. And it cannot be uh, any number uh, other than six, probably ten. And he did mention even numbers would be okay as well, such as two or four. So the initial presentation was in 2016. Um, it was a team of obsessions and compulsions. Uh, this was to us, by the way, in PPUKM. So the thing that we could get from his obsessions was probably contamination. Uh, because he would be bathing repeatedly, uh, doubts because he has this compulsion of just checking uh, the time and orderliness or counting. So essentially, if he was to switch on a light, he would need to do it exactly six times. Um, so patient otherwise was unable to actually express the reason behind his compulsions. He just says he feels very anxious if he's unable to do these rituals or compulsions and just does it to relieve the anxiety that he's had. So, of course, the symptoms had impaired his interpersonal, social, academic, and occupational functioning. So, it was also noticed by people around him that uh, if he was to hear a question, sometimes it may not even be directed to him. If he heard a question by somebody who was passing by, he would need to answer it. So, and if he was not uh, able to answer it because the person had walked by, he would get jammed. So... This feeling of being jammed, if he's unable to complete his compulsion or ritual, was described as a feeling of restlessness and anxiety that he has inside him, yet at the same time, he cannot think, he cannot move, and he just feels like it's frozen. But the anxiety there is very overwhelming and persists. 
the shortest duration of this jamming episodes is about 30 minutes and the long, longest duration may actually last several hours uh, up to a whole day. So he's actually sought treatment from approximately five doctors or private psychiatry clinics over the course of about three to four years before contact with us in 2016. And he's actually been tried on several combinations of medications of um, antidepressants and antipsychotics. Uh, during his time in the private center, he also had several sessions of acute ECT and also maintenance. So, since uh, his psychiatric contact with us in 2016, he said four inpatient admissions, and generally it's for the management of the OCD symptoms. So, during his, his admission in the ward, we'd be uh, optimizing his medications as well as having inpatient a CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy and uh, exposure response prevention therapy as well. So the clinical psychologist psychologists will be coming in daily to do these sessions with him. And uh, should he be discharged, he'd actually be very compliant to his medications monitored by his parents and then be under regular follow-up uh, with the psychiatrist and the psychologist. Uh, his last appointment was on the 16th of February uh, with myself. He still has the OCD symptoms and I noticed that when he walked into the room, he needed to switch on the light about six times. Uh, he still needs to put certain amount of um, spoons or uh, dishes on his plate. Um, and he, he himself notices the rep repetitions is usually about six times. Even 16 times is okay. Uh, it has to do with the number six. Maximum amount of time will be 10. He realizes that the minimum number of time will be two. And he said it could be more related to an even number. He does not do things in odd numbers. Uh, he still has his episodes of being jammed. Um, according to his mom, sometimes it will last two days actually recently. So it's not even several hours. And because of these jam episodes, when he can't move, he can't talk, he obviously can't go to work. Yeah. Um, and he needs actually MCs quite often. Uh, overall uh, improvement described by patient himself, he said about 50%. So that means after being treated by several doctors over the past 10 years, improvement has only been 50%. He's not been in full remission. Otherwise, he has no overt mood symptoms, um, no panic attacks, no perceptual disturbances. Uh, the anxiety generally comes when he's unable to complete his rituals or compulsions. In terms of his birth and childhood history, he was born full term via spontaneous vaginal delivery. There were no significant um, antenatal complications associated. Uh, he's got three siblings. He's the second child. He had no uh, um, missing of any developmental milestones, all achieved within normal time frame. However, he did have aneurysis at the age of 8 to 10, but no treatment was sought. So generally during that time, the mom just taught him how to clean himself. He was pretty much an average student. Um, he completed UPSR up to SPM. He actually was unable to complete his tertiary education, which was a diploma in business. He dropped out after a year. He did fail several exams, and it did have to do with the fact of uh, he was having the OCD symptoms at that time. Uh, no OCD, uh, sorry, no ADHD symptoms were noted in the past. In terms of work, after he dropped out, um, he got a job at his father's company. Uh, the father works in uh, works with glass and aluminium, so he'd actually be uh, putting parts uh, of different furniture of sort together. So he tries to work. He does have a salary, but he needs MC regularly, about one to two times a week. And it's because of these jamming episodes. Uh, in terms of family history, his mom does have OCD as well, and his eldest brother does have a psychiatric illness. Uh, under a private clinic, uh, possibly schizophrenia, but we cannot say what the diagnosis is at this point. He has no uh, significant uh, substance use. In terms of his pre-morbid history, before the onset of his illness, before the age of 19, he was a friendly and happy person, very cheerful. He enjoyed playing the piano and basketball, something which he cannot do anymore. Um, he had no obsessional traits, but may worry about trivial matters occasionally. Uh, mental state examination, uh, which I had done just about two weeks ago, 
So it's a Chinese gentleman of average build, was wearing a t-shirt and pants, neat, good hygiene, calm, cooperative, can maintain good eye contact, good rapport established. He speaks mainly Malay language to me. Um, he was relevant, coherent. He spoke in a normal rate, tone and amount. There were no repetition of words, syllables or sentences throughout the whole conversation and consultation. He described his mood to be okay. His effect was congruent uh, to his thoughts. He had no perceptual disturbances. Um, one thing of note uh, during the consultation, he was slightly distressed when he had to fill in a form during that consultation. I noted that he needed to lift the pen from a paper that he was writing on before proceeding to the next sentence. He lifted it several times, which I noted because of the dots that were there um, after the word he had written. And he was frowning as he was doing so um, because he was trying to stop himself from repeating the action. Essentially, he was trying to use the uh, mechanisms taught to him by CBT. There were a few investigations done for him, uh, one being an electroencephalogram done in 2014 at a private center. Um, mini mental state examination done for him was 30 out of 30, done in 2019. Uh, Yale Brown OCD scale, which was just recently done, is 24, which is severe um, after 10 years of treatment. His blunt investigations done were unremarkable, no abnormalities. His current treatment would be Luvox, uh, an antidepressant, uh, clomipramine, uh, olanzapine, and risperidone. So essentially, uh, two antidepressants and two antipsychotics. Uh, in terms of psychological treatment, he's currently still going for CBT and exposure response prevention therapy. So according to the clinical psychologist, he has been improving, although not 100%, uh, he has improved uh, quite a bit over the past few years. So he had previous treatments. Um, it's actually a lot of medications to go through, but essentially what I would like to show with the slides was that there were so many medications that had been on and tried on since 2013 up to now. So Prozac, Aripiprazole, uh, Acetylopram, things of that sort have been tried before this. Um, ECT had been tried um, initially in 2014 when he tried the ECT at the private center, noted some improvement, but sometime in 2014 when he was just doing ECT without medications, there were no improvement and in fact at one point his symptoms worsened. So yeah. So based on all of that, um, I think we can kind of guess what the diagnosis would be. It would be treatment-resistant obsessive compulsive disorder. So why is it treatment-resistant? He has undergone an adequate trial of um, SSRIs or antidepressants or clomipramine, but it shows unsatisfactory results. Essentially, the patient has never been in full remission uh, throughout the course of his illness. So that's uh, about my patient, Mr. W. Uh, I'll pass on the case to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Jin, who will talk more about um, OCD. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Prof. Mahani, and thank you, Dr. Sherin, for the test presentation. So I will continue on with the discussion for OCD, specifically treatment-resistant uh, OCD. Okay, so this is my aim for my um, presentation. The common myth about OCD. First, OCD is about obsessive cleanliness. So, classic example of what we think of when we talk about OCD is people who are terrified of germs or want everything to be clean and neat. Yeah? But OCD is beyond that. Second myth, OCD is caused by childhood difficulties. And third myth, stress causes OCD. Okay? So, OCD is not a direct manifestation of childhood difficulties, 
People may equate OCD as a stress response, but OCD is beyond that. So, by the end of my presentation, I would like to rebut this common myth about OCD. So, the content of my presentation will include clinical features, diagnosis, etiology, and management. The lifetime prevalence for OCD is about 2 to 3 percent, and it runs the chronic cause. In the first degree family members, the risk is higher, it's about 10 to 11 percent. So, in the case of Mr. W, his mother has OCD, so you can see the high, the higher risk of him getting OCD as compared to the normal population. The mean age of OCD is about 20 years. There is quite equal distribution uh, in sites where uh, the male and female has rather equal distribution of uh, getting OCD. Okay. So, going into the clinical features, when we talk about OCD, there are two important components that we talk about. Okay, first, obsessions. So, what are obsessions? Obsessions are recurrent and persistent thoughts, impulses or images that are experienced as intrusive and unwanted. So, there are components other than thoughts here. It's either thoughts, impulses or images. And these obsessions, they, they cause market anxiety. Usually, the person would be able to identify that this arises from their own thoughts or impulses. And because of the market anxiety, they attempt to suppress and neutralize these thoughts, which comes out as the compulsions that we often observe. Yeah? And because of this whole cycle of distress and trying to neutralize things, they may lead to secondary depression or guilt. So, some of the common things for people with uh, OCD, some of the things for obsessions are like contamination and death, where they feel that uh, either every part of the body or certain parts of the body are dirty, contaminated, unhygienic. Yeah? Other things are like rituals. So, for example, certain things need to be done in certain days or one comes after another. So, these are, certain, these are some of the obsessions. Uh, about rituals that they have. Okay, so next thing is another thing where certain things needs to be arranged in certain orders. Yeah, uh, another common one is doubts where um, they have doubts on uh, certain things like, uh, for example, whether the switch has been turned on or off, whether the doors have been locked, whether the answers that they have given are right or wrong. Yeah. So, uh, in response to these obsessions, uh, they may have, they may or may not have compulsions depending on the obsessions that they are experiencing. So, what are compulsions? These are repetitive behavior or mental acts driven to perform in response to an obsession or according to rules that must be applied rigidly. So, these compulsions, they are aimed to prevent or reduce the distress caused by the obsessions. And the thoughts of carrying out the act are not pleasurable. So, for example, if the person has uh, obsessions on dirt or contamination, they may end up having repeated hand washing or taking long shower, a long time to shower. If, let's say, they are experiencing doubts, they may end up uh, repeatedly checking on whether things are uh, are correct. They repeatedly need assurance on certain answers or certain things that they. Uh, have thoughts on. Okay? If they have a ritualistic uh, obsessions, then they end up counting or doing things uh, ritually one after another. If some goes to symmetry, they may have compulsion of being in order and repeating things in response to the uh, obsessions that they have. Okay. Some of the taboos surrounding OCD, forbidden or taboo thoughts, um, some people, some patients, they may experience uh, sexual thoughts that are very distressing. Some they have religious thoughts that are not um, that are not sort of in line with the normal culture and normal practice, and this causes a lot of anxiety and uh, distress. Some may have violence or aggression thoughts, and some may also have suicidal thoughts. Okay. So, because of these uh, forbidden and tribal thoughts, they may end up engaging in behaviors that is also distressing to they themselves because of the difference in culture and beliefs. Like, for example, they may masturbate in response to the sexual thoughts, or they, or they may practice certain mental acts like praying that are not uh, commonly practiced. Okay. 
So the vicious cycle of OCD, when a patient has obsessive thought, this gives rise to a lot of anxiety. And to cope with that anxiety, to neutralize the obsessive thoughts, they engage in compulsive behaviors. And the compulsive behavior may um, provide temporary relief to the obsessive thoughts. But this is a vicious cycle where after the temporary relief, it reinforces the need to act more on the obsessions. And they go into the cycle of repeatedly engaging in compulsive behavior in response to the obsessive thought. So likewise, in our case, Mr. W, he has got, uh, he has got a lot of obsessions about cleanliness, about how things need to be done, symmetry. And he goes into this jump period where... Uh, he was unable to move on uh, with the market anxiety and uh, distress. So to diagnose uh, OCD, we follow the SM5, the presence of either obsessions or compulsions or both. The obsessions or compulsions, they cause market distress, they are time-consuming, usually they are exposed more than an hour a day, and they significantly interfere with one's routine, just like in the case of Mr. W. Okay. So, some of the confusion or misunderstanding when we talk about OCD versus other mental illness, uh, one of it is OCPD. So, in OCPD, you may also observe people who are very uh, adhere to strict orderliness and control. They may do things in certain ways. Uh, but the difference between OCD versus OCPD is that in OCD, the behavior stems from the need to avoid the anxiety. Whereas in OCPD, there is the need to be perfect uh, in response to why they are behaving in such a way. Another common uh, confusion is between OCD versus autism spectrum disorder. So in autism spectrum disorder, they are, uh, I mean, the patients may engage in restrictive or repetitive behaviors that have fixed Excited intro, so they may repeatedly do things one after another. But this, uh, this behavior that they are, that they engage with, they derive pleasure from it. They are not bound to uh, reduce anxiety as compared to people with OCD. So the etiology of OCD is very complex. If you look at this diagram, there are so many factors involved, but specifically for genetic architecture of OCD. These are the defects that have been uh, shown to contribute to OCD genetic architecture. So, a pers- so there may be polymorphism uh, that can occur. These are all defects in the gene. There are copy number variants, there are mutations, differential gene. Uh, expression, altered DNA methylation. All these uh, give rise to the interactions of genetic variants with the phenotype. Then the genes involved in synaptic processes, neurodevelopmental, immune and inflammatory systems are also involved here. So all these contribute to the disrupted brain circuits in uh, people with OCD, specifically in the cortical skeletal pathway. And they have this regulation in the serotonin neurotransmitter. Okay. Some of the findings in PET scan and in radiological findings are also evidence. Okay, so by now I hope that I have got some of the common myths about OCD. Uh, let me go through a bit on the management. So 20 to 30 percent of uh, people with OCD, they have significant improvement in their symptoms. However, a large number of them, about 40 to 50 percent, they only experience moderate improvement. And about 20 to 40 percent remain ill or their symptoms worsen. Okay, so because of the distress caused by OCD, one third of them have actually suffered from major depressive disorder. So, treatment-resistant OCD, whether we use the word treatment-resistant, treatment-refractory, intractable OCD, these are all interchangeable terms that are used across literatures. So, what it basically means is the person has no response or less than 25% of the objective score uh, in improvement. They have had a minimal trial of two different SSR of antidepressant at a maximum dosage for at least three months each. They fail to respond to pranipramine with a minimum three-month trial, 
and at the same time, they already had concurrent behavioral therapy while on medications. So, likewise, in the case of Mr. Dabu, he has had, across the uh, timeline of his illness, he has had tried on more than two uh, antidepressants. At the moment, he's on clobosomy. He has been tried on clobosomy in the past. He is still on clobosomy, adequate dose. And at the same time, he is also on uh, therapy as well. Okay. So, this is the diagram that shows... Uh, the, how the standard care of treatment for people with kidney resistant OCD. Okay, so at level one, at level one, uh, antidepressant and CBT uh, would be the standard of treatment. Okay, and if the done response, uh, the treatment cost will go to level two. Okay, where another SS antidepressant or primary panel will be tried. Okay, and if let's say there is inadequate response for 10 to 12 weeks at level 3, the augmentation will be with either antidepressant, antipsychotic, in this case, Mr. Wong, we tried on uh, uh, raspberry dawn, and these are other options that can be considered. Yeah. So if let's say at these three levels, the treatment is still insufficient to control the illness, then the consideration for neurosurgical um, intervention uh, is an option. So this is a chart to just show the dosing of SSRI in OCD. In uh, treatment in OCD, usually we aim for higher dose of uh, antidepressant, like from the examine, if you look at here, it's 400 milligrams. Uh, in Mr. Wong's case, we have 300 milligrams. It has to be way between the benefits and the risks. But generally, higher doses of SSRI were associated with greater efficacy in the treatment of OCD. Some of the literatures have also reported on different different agents that have been tried across, uh, but none with consistent results. Okay, for example, like benzodiazepine, uh, morphine, momentine, you know, anti uh, mood stabilizer like carbamazepine, lamotrigine, lithium. These are all have been tried. Uh, whether it is in uh, ICT or test reports, but the results have not been consistent. Okay. So, a little bit on the non-pharmacological management for OCD. Um, so, we talk about CBT and ERP. ERP stands for Exposure and Res Response Prevention Therapy, which has been ongoing for Mr. Uh, w. Okay. Um, so, what they do is they gradually expose people to situations that provoke a person's obsessions and resulting distress while helping them prevent their compulsive responses. Okay. And recent literatures have incorporated family components in therapy sessions, like uh, reduce, uh, the aim is to reduce parental investment in rituals to reinforce the ritualistic behavior, train them to monitor patients, as such. Yeah. So, for non pharmacological treatment, the principle is let the initial doubt be there and drop the behaviors that strengthen it. Yeah. Uh, but it is a process and it takes time to work. Okay. So, um, neurobiological approaches we have uh, for Mr. W, there will be ECT, there are test reports that show improvement uh, up to a year, but beyond that, there has not been any reports. Lah. Okay, and also other neurosurgical interventions that have been uh, emerging in recent times. Okay, so is the key to unlock a drone door for Mr. W neurosurgical intervention in this case? Okay, I think we will hear that shortly. Okay, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum and good morning. Um, first of all, I would like to say thank you very much for the 
uh, to the Department of Psychiatry for inviting uh, us a neurosurgery for their CTC. As uh, mentioned earlier by Prof. Mahani at the beginning, it's a rare, a rare occasion that uh, neurosurgery and psychiatry can come together and present a case in the CTC. This is the first time. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting us. I mean, take three hours to take a bath, to complete a bath, and another four to five hours to complete a meal. I can't imagine that. It's so severe for for this for this case, so severe. So I was uh, so surprised when I read the case study about this patient. So, and and uh, he's been suffering for the past ten years, and he's a uh, uh, refractory or resistant to medical intervention. So, uh, uh, we are hoping that uh, with the advancements of the uh, option, with neurological option that we have in our disposal, I hope that we can help this patient uh, to uh, bring back his uh, normality in his life. So, uh, that's my introduction. Surgery and radiation for the OCD. The past the, sorry, the past of the second surgery can be traced back many, many centuries. From the transformation and extraction of stone for the madness, and the base of modern psychosurgery starts when resection of frontal lobe was found to have no effect on the intelligence and basic function but changes the emotion and behavior. From then on, neuroanatomy has developed and frontal lichotomy has become popular. However, not long after, psychosurgery failed the demise because of the heated criticism and debate on the transorbital lobotomy. At the same time, the discoveries of many antipsychotic drugs has opened up the option of treatment for psychiatric illness. The old era has passed. We have no in medicine. Nowadays, we have more understanding of human brain functions, its anatomy and its physiology. We have functional MRI scans that can help correlate the area of brain which abnormally stimulated on certain diseases. We know the pathway and neuronal circuit involved in different neurological disorders. And nowadays, we have validated outcome assessment tools so everyone around the world uses a common grading scale to judge how the severity before and after the procedure. Therefore, comparison is unbiased. Results from trials and research become objective and transparent, and scientific guidelines from expert bodies are generated for the medical community to follow. Ultimately, when we apply this in our day-to-day -day practice, what is essential will be a proper person selection, the inclusion and expression criteria, compared to society and medical regulations, and uh, A proper person selection, the inclusion, exclusion criteria, compared to society and medical legal regulations, and be transparent to the person on the ends of surgery, the risk involved, and possible complications. You can, you can see that now we have guidelines and algorithms. This is uh, the suggested treatment algorithm for OCD in above published journal in 2017. In OCD, after all strategical interventions and pharmacological treatment are exhausted, other differential diagnoses are ruled out. There is an indication at the bottom of this algorithm for neurological procedures, usually at the last resort for the new responders that has receptors to all available treatment, which is a uh, 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 which is uh, equal to this operation. Generally, this is the indication for no surgical interventions for person with OCD, must properly diagnose as OCD for more than five years, and systematically try all treatment options, and the disorder is causing substantial suffering and reduced psychosocial functioning with poor prognosis, and the person is willing to give informed consent and participate in pre- and post-op packages of evaluation and rehabilitation. Last criteria is there must be a responsible physician 
willing to follow up for post hoc long term management. This is the latest 2019 consensus on increasing criteria in which a few more points were added. There was no objective definition on diagnosis based on valid criteria, cut off working for the severity of illness, and what is means by exhaustion of treatment. Also, they are required an independent professional to confirm and agree with the previous assessor on the effectiveness of the treatment. And last, the nation must have proper expectations on the outcome of surgery. This is the new exclusion criteria, which mainly focuses on exclusion patients with concurrent complicating pathologies and also those who have poor cognitive potential issues like blood alcohol and suicidal intention. Of course, as a surgeon, we need to screen and examine patients to assess the general fitness to undergo the specific procedure, either it will be done under TA or LA or sedation, and also any distortion of normal anatomy. This is current goals and the assessment scoring for OCD, the, 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 the yield point of OCD scale, which includes two components. Um, Number one to five is obsessive symptom, uh, and number six to ten includes compassion assessment measurement score. The measurement score uh, of forty in which scoring eight to fifteen is graded as mild, twenty four to thirty one is severe, and thirty two to forty is extreme OCD. The cutoff point for surgical intervention is twenty eight and, and above. Certain countries are required. An additional factor that we have brought, like in Australia, uh, which the committee consists of at least one neurosurgeon, few psychiatrists, a lawyer, and qualified competent layperson that will go through another round of screening to ensure there is no negligence in the process to ensure the welfare of the patient. This is good way how the medical faculty try to overcome the society fear towards passivity of psychosurgery. With the advancements of technology and knowledge, the new modern era of psychosurgery has come and we should not fix it in the old impression of the past. So those are not so far, more precise and less invasive. We will evaluate our testimony for the treatment in our center itself. Our patients should be given an equal chance, like patients are the country in aspect to this last piece of treatment as long as correct selection is being made. When we talk about surgery for OCD, there are two aspects that we need to consider. First, it's according to its approach. Generally, there are two approaches in the lesioning or neuromodulation. Lesioning, or also called as adaptive surgery or disruptive surgery, refers to neurosurgical procedure that could be self targeted circumscribed lesion, reasons a specific area of the brain or specific for the mechanism of disease. This can be achieved by either using radio frequency probe or it will be inserted directly via a static manner. If not, we can use factors in relation or focus ultrasound to achieve that. Really, this response is less invasive. Neural uh, modulations refer to implantation of electrodes to specific targeted area, targeted electrical stimulation. And modify the specific circuit involved. The common remediation procedure include deep brain stimulation (DBS) and less common verbal stimulation and non-invasive transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is the latest treatment. There are few common target locations for different types of approach. Commonly, for the single gyros, the subcortical tracks, and the limbs are integrated through. Uh, Subterranean nuclei and others. This is due to the reason that there are two major factors involved in the mechanisms of OCD. The commonest and most fundamental factor is the city of Silo, a cortical structure, paired with a lot of cortical circuit. All these commonly utilized targets are located uniquely in the focus area amenable for lesioning or stimulation within these loops, especially the uh, until the limb of internal capsule, ALIC. As you can see, the ALIC is also involved in the other two less common circuit. This is the most common factor in treating OCD surgically. 
facilitate support in sectors of purpose. According to the same targets, different policies can be applied. For example, the use of transcranial stimulation for the prefrontal cortex and anti-racing blood cortex, and the use of measuring or a reduction of the anti-racing blood cortex causing glutamine until the name of the internet capsule called anti-racapsulotomy, substantial inanimatic called subcardic lactomy, and collectively called limbic lactomy. Also, can use deep destination targeted on the LAARC or subthalamic nuclei. Uh, deep brain stimulation is a surgical procedure. This stimulation areas are permanently implanted in the specific targets in the brain and connected to a pulse generator embedded under the skin, under the chest, under the chest wall. Uh, this generator continuously delivers electrical impulse to the airtress and changes the electrical activity of the target area and this will network either inhibit or stimulate. Uh, this treatment has obtained a PA from a humanitarian design exemption for a civil and sexual refugee since 2009. The advantage, partially reversible, can switch on and off, can adjust the IT customization strengths. Uh, the best advantage includes its high cost of hardware and the need of maintenance, and it is more invasive with implanted limbs and different surgical complications. The latest contain also include person A. Okay. Uh, uh, Today, uh, 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 I have the immediate response of DPS in movement disorder. My similar reduction in OCD symptoms usually is just really over the first year after the surgery. And you can also see that at the same time, the anxiety score and depression score also decrease along. The most personal adverse effect include the development of hypomania occurring in about a third of patients. In the majority of these cases, adverse mood results were changing. And we will connect with reprogramming. Um, other adverse events are anxiety, agitation, impulsivity, sleep disorders, memory problems, surgical related complications like 35% rate of infection, increased number, seizure, and suicidal ideation. The last meta-analysis published in 2016 also confirmed a mean global reduction in OCD scores of 25% with DPS treatment and global responders of 60%. According to the only guidelines available so far, DPS is an acceptable and effective treatment for reception of CD with one level of evidence and two level two evidence studies so far showing its efficacy. Its efficacy the federal study actually proves it by turning it on and off as intervention and control in a double-blinded manner and with cross over and issue significant differences. Although there are many possible types of electrode placement, like subtermic nuclei and dental capsule, the local study has shown that there is no significant difference in the efficacy in terms of extent of reduction in OCD symptoms. But proceeding a gentle capsule may have greater effect on mood whereas the second in the placement improves cognitive flexibility more markedly. Other than this training, other neuromodulation treatments like weather, uh, weather mist stimulation is still relatively new in neurosurgery for OCD. Uh, whereas stress training magnetic stimulation is done in the treatment and often and often carried out by the psychiatrist. Then we talk about lesioning or uh, ablative surgery. The term ablative refers to creating precise targeted circumstantial lesions within the diameter of white metal tracks. Contemporary ablation leads to interruption or irreversible termination of function of the tissue. 
it could be done by a specialty generator heat to a brain electrode or focus laser, or focus at the same under a mild guidance or by focus irradiation or organized. This technique usually acquires in the company, set a quick track company, and create a select company according to their target location. The frequency of the is only done under security manner in which a heat frame will be applied and under the means in the region, a monitor probe is inserted directly to the target and is projected that it is up to 75 to 85 degrees Celsius for 75 to 100 seconds to the general illusion. The best way to be done under LA with light situation. Usually, the patients do not report any subjective sensation while the targets are being used. Only after after knowing their experience of it, reduce initiatives and mental growth for four to three months. Uh, this appears to correlate with second second using the edema, and the symptoms disappear once the edema subsided. From the case of the response to treatment of RFA to different targets range from 25 to 85 percent. This responders red being this underground until they get through to me. Focus at the same extent to get over of creating targeted religions in combination with the security frame. In combination with MRI techniques that allow measurement of fixed niches within the frame, and MRI guided focus at the same system was developed to create big structured brain lesion with that cryotomy. At this time, if this technology is still very new and not many studies have been performed. In the recent studies, by the way, at all, this treatment was performed in six persons with OCD without serious clinical or radiographic adverse events. A total of a person with OCD in the OCD scale was observed. Uh, another thing is by using laser, we call it LIPT, uh, laser intercessor thermal therapy. The procedure is almost similar to earlier studies in which the person needs to undergo imaging study the same day with intraarm navigation. After GA induction, a progress was made uh, according to the target and a fiber optic catheters were introduced to it. Uh, an intraoperative CT scan was then used to confirm the catheter placements. Uh, then the fiber optic catheters uh, were connected to uh, uh, the fiber optic cables as well as a pump cell cooling circuit and the laser will deliver to induce thermal injury and lesioning. Uh, according to the literature, this treatment shows 78% full responder rate and is generally well corrected. Okay. Looking at compression by locations for advocacy lesioning, this material research shows that the treatment seems to have a highest percentage of responders, and the OCD scores drop equally among all different target locations. Uh, when this is capsule, the component is an uh, anterior limb of internal capsule. Okay, uh, then uh, last but not least, focus in lesion can be given to produce lesion with similar effect. Uh, while the previous medicine procedures were performed surgically, Government has provided a way to produce accurate lesions without subjecting the patient to a surgical operation. In this treatment, 192 gamma beams emitted by a cobalt system are circles in the anterior limb of the internal capsule. Individually, the beams emit a low radiation dose, but the concern has 192 beams at one point. The several hours allows a dose equal or higher than 150 gray. Uh, I was measuring at the desired site in good position. The advantage of the journey is that there is no need to open the sky, no need to enter the air and emotion. Overall, the lesioning procedures also benefit to about 45% to 65% of patients with injectable OCD. Uh, in this RCP, uh, involving 16 percent, that could clearly show that gamma ventral capsulotomy did significantly improve the OCD symptoms compared to the control. The difference in this effect includes asymptomatic radiation indices, other common adverse effects include abdominal, mood changes, headache, and 
Kung ano sa kanin, the number is less than 3%. In relation to the uses comparing in BPS, this combination may be relation to a practice of use of treatment of this activity with different personal and significant differences. Thus, this approach is equally effective in the treatment and therefore the suggested that choice of intervention should take account of other performed surgeon and institutional factors instead. I guess we will compare the different approaches we may find them in the case of the case of multi areas and now that we are problem that reduction side effect which is negligible. The rest of the reduction side effect all involves some form of assistance because they invest in procedure and surgical risk. Therefore, Using your approach and this target location should be personalized and take consideration of many more factors. Nonetheless, when the advancement of technology, more treatment options will still be more and we believe the domestic or focus surgery should be accessible for this indicator in our country as well. So, I'm looking at the end of my presentation. For this case, uh, person, I think he's been suffering for this uh, condition for the last 10 years. All the pharmacotherapy and uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is uh, not really optimized or good, good, good result for him, I think is a time to. Uh, so this uh, is what we call psychosurgery. surgery. Uh, uh, we, hope, uh, we hope that uh, in the future, uh, there will be a good uh, collaborative work between the uh, psychiatry department and the surgical unit or the surgical department uh, to find a suitable case for us to do uh, the case. This is the best example that uh, we, can, we can try with that. The literature is very much here, and from the literature we know that this is among the best treatment for the infectious case of the OCD, and we have the best target for the one is the antivirum of the internet cancer. Although we never done case before, but we are planning. If there is a, if, if this case is, uh, if this person agree, uh, we are planning to bring a, uh, and obviously us expert who been doing this ca cases like this to be able to, uh, observe the, for the procedure. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Prof. Farizal, Dr. Jane, and Dr. Shireen. Uh, so we still have about five minutes. Uh, so uh, I think I'll start with uh, a question to uh, Prof. Farizal. Yeah? Uh, so you, you find, sound quite inviting for us to go for Gamanai, for this patient. Uh, right, uh, that, that's good. Yeah? Actually, the family is actually looking forward to that. Yeah? Uh, and if it's done, it's going to be the first in Malaysia. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, so we will make history. <laughs> Hopefully. Right. Uh, okay, uh, my question is uh, a, a bit technical. Yeah? Uh, so because uh, uh, we were told that gamma knife is quite expensive treatment. So for patients who cannot afford, uh, what, I what are the options for them? The, the gamma knife facility here is at the UKM Specialist Center, which is a private wing uh, of the UKM, FC, uh, UKM Holdings. So, unfortunately, patients have to pay for the treatment. Uh, normally, they, if they have insurance, we use the insurance. Uh, but if they don't have insurance, they can uh, self uh, paying uh, the treatment. So, but we uh, don't really we have other mobility, for example, we can refer them to Kebajikan, uh, or also we can refer them to 
uh, other uh, non-governmental organizations, for example, Rotary Clubs or for Pusat Zakat for Muslims, and also so the Republic of the Council for Women, the U.S. Embassy is under uh, UK America Center. Uh, the human is a uh, uh, this this human costs about thirty three thousand, which is very uh, cheap compared to other countries. Right? For example, in Indonesia, it costs about eighty thousand Malaysian ringgit. So thirty three k is the cheapest uh, human for this kind of uh, procedure. Uh, but we do give a discount for for you can you can medical center patient. Uh, uh, um, so. Thank you, for the uh, uh, thank you for mentioning the price because uh, when you launched uh, Gamma Knife two three years ago, uh, I mean uh, we got the impression that it was hundred thousand. <laughs> that's about uh, seventy. All right, okay. Uh, that's that's good to know. Uh, yeah, uh, we can make ways for the patient to actually uh, go for uh, uh, this intervention. And the other thing uh, that I was concerned uh, uh, is, you know. Suggesting something that is um, uh, unconditional. Uh, what do you say? Uh, it's not uh, traditional uh, tra uh, treatment for a vulnerable patient. You know, uh, um, it can be quite tricky. Yeah? If something happens along the way, then you know who should be responsible. But I like uh, that you mentioned uh, in the board uh, uh, deciding for the intervention. There is a lawyer there. Yeah, that's that's important. So uh, maybe I can open the floor for one or two questions. Anybody have any question? Uh, no question. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, so this patient actually is a patient that is uh, uh, kept for in in my team actually with Dr. Jane and Dr. Hajar. Eh? Uh, and since the past ten years ago. Uh, the patient actually did not like gradually deteriorated like that. Eh? There were times when actually he responded to treatment, uh, and once he actually went to college uh, for you know quite uh, long also, uh, and developed his social uh, support as well. And then uh, the you know uh, the usual story, uh, stopping medications and you know getting back in relapse and a few uh, episodes like them. Like that, uh, you know, uh, um, contributed to, to the, you know, to the current stage, lah. But uh, uh, and also uh, uh, for medical students, especially, yeah, uh, when you hear about uh, this patient, don't get the idea that all, uh, you know, uh, OCD is like this. Uh, he's actually like uh, not an average patient in terms of uh, outcome. Yeah. Uh, we have quite a number of patients who actually like recovered uh, much more better. Uh, compared to this patient. Yeah, Prof. Chan. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, just a quick question. So, um, would we imagine that if uh, this patient uh, successfully underwent the surgery, um, usually would medication still be continued or the surgery would be considered a cure? Okay. Uh, first, first of all, I just want to, uh, to clear first. Uh, this means gamma knife surgery doesn't involve cutting the scalp, open the skull, going to the brain at all. Uh, this is uh, this is just re irradiation. Okay, uh, so there's no uh, uh, extra surgery involved. It's just virtual surgery, so you can't see the knife in, in this operation. Um, so uh, to answer the question, normally after the procedure, it doesn't respond. As I mentioned in the lecture, it's not like. Uh, we do say uh, treatment for Parkinson's or, or missing disorder, whereby after the uh, procedure, the patient will respond immediately. But for the psychosurgery, uh, the studies will, uh, will talk about between six months to uh, a year before you start having the same the difference in the patients. Uh, even sometimes after two years, we uh, still have to see the improvement after the after the, the treatment. So of course, uh, we need to continue the mitigation as usual uh, after the treatment, uh, at least until we see the 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 optimum of the mission uh, improvement. The average is after a year. The 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 year is still seeing the improvement. So between the treatment and a year, of course, we need to continue the mitigation as usual. 
almost nothing to do here yeah? uh, and probably something to gain also eh? uh, we are quite excited actually to uh, discuss further yeah? uh, on the potential of gamana for this patient and i think 30000 is quite affordable uh, all right okay time is up uh, i would like to thank our presenters yeah? prof uh, pariza yeah? for a nice presentation uh, you have uh, highlighted the indication the uh, Uh, the evidences yeah, is level one uh, evidence yeah, meta analysis uh, and the procedure itself yeah. uh, so that's very good Dr Jane thank you for highlighting the uh, about OCD and uh, Dr Sirin actually the case is much more complex but you have given a good summary on uh, on on uh, on the case yeah. uh, thank you very much yeah. so uh, thanks also to all the audience yeah. I can see Prof Muhammad thank you for coming. <laughs> and the other uh, lecturers as well uh, and students thank you for uh, attending uh, this uh, cpc uh, i hope you, you all can learn something uh, and uh, yeah so we can close our our cpc but the students i think will stay on to answer the kahoot quizzes yeah uh, okay have a good day everybody assalamu alaikum Untuk medical student, uh, kita ada quizzes eh. So, boleh quizzes ni ada mata lah yang akan dapat. Jadi, saya kena bayar dekat sini eh. Dekat atas tak boleh. Yeah, boss. Mr. Pani, okay. GMP ada tak? Kat belakang dia tak keluar lah. Kat pun tak keluar.
Okey untuk quizis uh, ni nombor dia 24 3272 Ah, betul, guna tambah nombor metrik eh Kita boleh tunggu Mungkin 10 saat lagi Satu Ok, ok Ya, dah ready ya. Ada yang kata belum tu. Dah eh? Okey.